everyone, this is Pastor Brian Cash, and I want to welcome you to the living room. Matter of fact, I'm welcoming you to actual my living room, and I'm so grateful that you all have decided to join us here tonight uh, and noon if you are watching us at noon as we continue and really finish our series around roadblocks to imagination. And uh, we started this journey uh, about almost four weeks ago now, and the hope was for us to see uh, that God desires for us to go on this trip, this journey with him uh, toward imagination. Imagination is seeing through the eyes of God, that I cannot uh, see where God wants me to be and where God wants or who God wants me to be uh, unless I take the time to see through God's lens or see through God's eyes. And we said that doing that or making that kind of choice is going to require some sense of roadblock. There are some, some things that are going to impede your progress from going forward, but don't be dismayed because roadblocks are only used to develop us and make us better and propel us to where God wants us to be. And so we started off with the risk, right? Genesis chapter 11 and 12, Abraham or Abram takes the risk and leaves. Then we went to opposition, um, that every time I take a risk, there's always going to be some sense of opposition in my way. But God causes me to take the risk and embrace the opposition because the opposition is my development. And then we moved from opposition to attitude. Instead of having the attitude of that don't make sense, have the attitude of yes, Lord, whatever you say. And then last Sunday, we dealt with decision, the decision to obey God without any questions. Well, I'm excited because this is coming to the end of this journey. And as I always do on Wednesday night in Bible study, I always uh, go through a kind of detailed explanation of the word because we, we cover so much. And I want you to catch all of the kind of um, details uh, that sometimes doesn't come out in the message, but comes out on Wednesday night. And so would you pray with me as we go into the study of the word today? Lord, we come and say thank you for this opportunity to share in your word and share the word that you have given to us. We pray, oh God, that you have blessed this experience tonight and bless the experience of those who are watching at noon and whatever time they're watching, that God, you would continue to lead them and guide them down the path you would have them to go. And God, we give you thanks. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. So we talked about roadblock to imagination and that last roadblock is the decision. The decision to obey God no questions asked. Now that, that's a very hard task because literally I am saying, God, I'm obeying you. I'm following your path. I'm following your directives. I'm following your direction without any questions. And that's hard because sometimes God's directions and, di and God's directives sometimes can be very ir irregular, abstract. It seems crazy. Uh, Abraham, take your only son and go to Mount Moriah and slay him. It seems out of the ordinary. doesn't make any sense. Noah, build an ark. And uh, there is no rain. You've never seen any rain before, but build a rock because it's going to rain. It just seems crazy, right? Uh, but literally what we discover is, is that God calls us to obey him. And God desires for us to obey him. And on this last kind of road to imagination, it is the decision to say, yes, God, I'm going to obey, no questions asked. And so uh, we go to Genesis chapter 22, which is this narrative. And we know this story by the, like the back of our hands, this story of Abraham, who has now come to full maturity has come to a place that we have never seen Abraham at before. Abraham is trusting God and obeying God, no questions asked. And God says, Abraham, take your son up to Mount, Mount Moriah, which is in the land, or scripture teaches us, it's in the region of Moriah. And this mountain that God says, I'm sending you to, is a mountain that is just somewhere in the land of Moriah. Now, we call it Mount Moriah because it's a mountain in the region of Moriah. Uh, we don't actually know particular the name of the mountain uh, or what was that mountain called before Abraham gives the name uh, Jehovah Jireh. This is the place where God provides. It's a mountain in the region of Moriah. That, that's important because 
as we get through uh, why we see or how we see the maturity of Abraham, it's really important to note that Abraham is going to Moriah and he's going to a mountain he has never seen before. And God says, go to Moriah and this is the place I'll show you. And at that place, at that mountain, God says, sacrifice your son, your only son. What a strange request, right? What, what a strange encounter, what something, what if, what if some type of irregular, irrational request from God. But the first verse says, God did this to test Abraham. And I want you to pay attention to this. That, that word test, as I said on Sunday, is the word which means to prove. It means to put one on display. Literally, God wanted to put Abraham on display. So God puts Abraham on display because there was something about Abraham that I believe God was so proud of. It's kind of like a parent that sees the maturity of or the growth in their child and they want to tell everyone, look at what my child did. I, I believe honestly that Abraham is at a place that God literally wants to show off his faithfulness. Chapter 22 is the full development of Abraham. It is a space where Abraham comes to where he says, God, I am obeying you. I've made the decision to obey you, no questions asked. Now that's a hard place to come and a hard place to be. But for all of us, it is a place that we ought to pray that we get to. I know personally, as I said on Sunday, that it is something that I'm praying and asking God to work on me. That when that when God says, okay, this is what I want you to do, that I can do it and not ask God any questions. And just say, God, I'm trusting you. And God, whatever you say is what I will do and obey. So the recap of chapter 22, we all know the story. He goes to Mount Moriah or the region of Moriah and goes to this mountain. The Lord says, I'm going to show you. And when he gets there, he takes his son, his only son, and goes to the mountain and is about to slay his son. And the angel comes out of nowhere and says, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. Don't, don't hurt or harm, bring harm to your son because uh, God knows that you fear him. And God knows that you uh, hold him in high regard because you did, you did not withhold your son from me. Um, but you put me in my right place and, and I was above everything, right? And so then he finds this ram in the bush. So let, let's deal with this tonight. Abraham was matured to the father of the faith by chapter 22 because he follows God's difficult requests without asking one question. Where God wants to take you, this is the key point for all of us. God does not need you getting sidetracked with your own questions. Many times we stop ourselves from following God's instructions because we start asking ourselves questions that are birthed out of our doubts. How many times have you asked God, well, God, are you sure? God says, I want you to do this, or I want you to speak to this person, or I want you to take a step on faith and trust me here. And you're saying, God, are you sure? You see, on the road to imagination, there is a roadblock called decision. And we have to decide to obey God's directions without any questions. How do we grow to the place of obeying God without any questions? But we shared on last Sunday, it requires us to be intentional about establishing God connections early. And I want to take my time and actually deal with this point so that you can see um, Abraham's intentionality in establishing a God connection early in comparison to where Abraham starts. So scripture says that Abraham rises up Early in the morning, Genesis chapter 22, verse 3, says, Abraham rose up early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. He, he got, gathered all of the young men he was going to gather, and then he got his son, and they headed for the region of Moriah. Now, I, I want you to pay attention to this because there's a phrase that I mentioned on Sunday that is key here. 
Abraham rose up early in the morning. Now this phrase is used several times throughout the Bible to illustrate that rising up in the morning means that I'm intentional about having God time. I'm intentional about three things. I'm intentional about consecration. That means I'm setting myself apart for a large task. And then I'm intentional about meditation. That means I'm concentrating on God's word or concentrating in being in my face place. Y'all remember that word face, that phrase face place. I'm concentrating on God because I know that the task of head is larger than me and it requires what I do not have. And so I need to meditate on God so that I hear God's voice, but then it requires isolation. I get by myself so I can hear God's voice in clear ways so that when I get along the journey or whatever I'm going to do, I'm, I know I'm going to be swarmed with all kinds of voices. I know there's going to be all kinds of different people talking in my ear and talking to me, and I do not need to get distracted from the task. And so Abraham does this as the tradition of Israel and the many of Israelites rises up early in the morning. And I believe he rises up early in the morning to have that intimate early connection with God. Now, this is important because I told you Abraham is maturing. Now, if we go to Genesis chapter 12, verse four, we're seeing Abraham leaving Haran and on his way to where God wants him to go to the promised land. Genesis chapter 12, verse four, this is Abram in chapter 12. It says, so Abram went away as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. Now in Genesis chapter 12, verse four, he has an amazing task. He has to leave his home and go to a place God has promised him in a place he's never been before. But what does Abram do? He just wakes up, he just gets up and goes. It never says anything about him rising up in the morning. I really want y'all to catch this because I hope you caught this on Sunday, but if not, I want you to pay attention to this. Abraham in chapter 12 is not rising up early in the morning. He is not intentional about God time, although we know that when he gets into rough situations, he does build altars. We talked about this in a few weeks ago in terms of opposition. Opposition will cause you to pray. But Abraham, before he even embarks on the journey, just goes. How many of us leave the house? We know we have a large task ahead and we do not pray and do not consult God. That, that's what Abram was doing. Abram was just getting up in the morning. The Lord told me to go, I'm going. No, 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 no. Abraham, Abraham uh, is essential for you to have morning time with God. Because when you get on the road, it is easier to stay connected to God because you have already established that connection early in the morning. It's Genesis chapter 13, verse one. Uh, says Abraham or Abram, so Abram went from Egypt to Nechvin and he and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot with him. Notice again, he just goes. He just gets up and goes, right? But Genesis chapter 22, verse three says Abraham does what? Rolls up early in the morning. Now you'll see as you keep reading uh, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 23 and Genesis chapter 20. Uh, for Abraham in his old age, he rises up in the morning because Abraham understands that if I'm going to do something essential for God and not ask any questions, I have to be in tune with God. You see, if I start off in the morning with God, that's why we talk promote the plug, shameless plug uh, of our, our, our prayer call in the morning, get up with God at 6 a.m. If I get up with God early in the morning and I have his voice in my ear, when I get into my rough patches along the journey, I don't have to worry about trying to find his voice because I was listening to his voice early in the morning. That's why I'm so intentional about getting up now in the morning even more now ever before because I know what the task I had and I know the devil is going to be busy. I know the enemy is going to try to come at me. And so what I've got to do is I got to start early in the morning and be connected to God's voice. Now, I love this because I shared with you on last Sunday. And if you, if you read in Genesis chapter 22, verse number three, it says the next morning, uh, Abraham got up early 
He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for fire. I want to go down to verse four. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. Now, if you go back to the request from God in verse two, it says, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. Underline one of the mountains. And yours, might, yours may read a little differently. But if you go back to verse number, verse number four, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And if you underline on a burnt offering on one of the mountains, one of the mountains means there is a mountain in the land of Moriah that I'm going to show you. But if you read verse four, when he gets to the land, and I think I inferred this on last on Sunday, that when he looks up, he automatically knows that's it. It's not a question of, is that the mountain over there? No. When you establish a God connection early, you don't have to question God because you already got God. You already got his voice in your ear. You're listening to him. You, you, you're quiet. You're, you're, you're saying to yourself, well, I need to uh, break away from all of this so I can get God's voice in my ear. And it's essential here. Because I can obey God completely without asking God any questions, especially if I keep the, the line of communication open. It's kind of like we used to have uh, um, uh, it, back when I was growing up, dial tone for the phone. And, and my mama would say, y'all stay off the, the phone and stay off the computer because I'm expecting a call. Keep the line clear. And that's what Abraham does when he's on his way to the mountain. He keeps the line clear. He starts the connection early in the morning. And when he gets to the mountain, the line is still clear. So he's not asking God, what mountain, what mountain are you trying to tell me to? It's kind of like I'm driving and somebody says, well, I'm, I'm trying to get directions now. Where, where I'm going? Where, but no, he's not saying God where I'm going. He's saying, that's the mountain right there. Why? Because I believe he had a clear connection with God early in that morning. For that whole trip, he rises up to have connection with God. So I, I want you to be intentional about your God time. I want you to be intentional about that because if you're going to grow to the place where you, you trust God and ask God no questions and you just follow after God, it's intentional. You have to be intentional about your morning time so that during the day, that line of communication is open. You get that? So that I'm talking with God all day long. You know that song, all day long? My heart, my soul is lifted in worship all, all day long. You know, all, all day long, we have, have a connection with God all day long. Uh, uh, it, it is essential for you to have that. So to, to be intentional about that connection time with God in the morning, uh, because when you start the day, it is so impactful. And you, don't, and you can obey God without asking any questions because of that. But then we said... Not only uh, does Abraham mature to the point that he is intentional about his God connection time, but also uh, he lets God as provider free him from the worry of how. So we said in order for you to get to this place where you obey God without asking any questions, you have to let God as provider. God is my provider. And if I understand God as provider, it will free me from the worry of trying to figure out how I'm going to do this, how I'm going to do that. I love this. Isaac says to Abraham, where is the lamb? Now, I shared to you on Sunday that Isaac is at least between the ages of 25 and 35. Some would suggest he's in his 20s. Some authors would suggest that because of the age of Sarah in chapter 23, as she, and when she passes away, Isaac is probably around the age of 35 or 36. We don't know, but we do know Isaac is a grown man. Um, and so uh, th th this narrative that Isaac is a little boy is not true. He's actually a grown man. And so he knows something about hunting. He knows something about wood. He knows something about sacrifice. And he definitely knows something about lambs, right? And so what Isaac is saying to his dad is, is that I know what, what we're supposed to have. And he's saying, well, where is the sacrifice? How is this going to work out essentially? How is all of this going to work out? I see wood, I see fire, I see even that knife in your hand. 
But where is the sacrifice? And listen to what Abraham says in verse eight. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt sacrifice. What Abraham essentially saying is this, God will see after it. I want you to put that in your mental bank uh, that, that literally that phrase, God will provide a lamb, uh, God provide himself a lamb. It literally means God will see after it. You know, someone says, I'll see after it. Don't worry about it. I got it. I'll see after it. Abraham says, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. God will see after it. Now, I want you to see that maturity in Abraham because Abraham usually is the one that's asking the questions. He's usually the one that's worried about the provision. He's usually the one that's trying to figure out how are things going to work out. Remember in Genesis chapter 15, verse 2, listen to what Abraham says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar? Genesis chapter 17, verse 17, what does Abraham do? Remember a few weeks ago, he laughs at God when God says you're going to have this child through your wife, uh, Sarah. Literally, he is the warrior. He is always worried. We know that because we, we've read the story. But I want to examine why he gets to this point where he knows God is providing. How, how does he get to this place? Well, this is my belief. I believe that Abraham rested, I want you to catch this, he rested on the promises of God. And because God had consistently kept God's promises through chapter 12, all the way to chapter 22, this is what Abraham understands. Catch this, if God promised it, then God will provide it. I, I wanna encourage you because the spirit just laid, laid that on my heart. I, I don't know who you are, but if God promised it, you better believe God's going to pro pro provide it. And you don't have to worry about the how. And I told you last Sunday about my wife telling me, that, saying when I was worried, she was saying, did you do everything you were supposed to do? If you did, God's going to do the rest. God's going to provide. And you have to believe it. Why? Because God promised it. Now, notice Genesis chapter 17, verse 17 is when he laughs. But Genesis chapter 17, verse 20 through 21 is when God promises that Isaac would be the promised one. It's in Genesis chapter 17, verse 20 through 21. Listen to this. After uh, Abraham says to God, well, you think uh, that uh, this is going to work through Sarah. We've already figured out the answer. We've got Ishmael. You know, choose Ishmael as your blessing. And listen to what God says to Abraham. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. Listen to verse 21. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you this season next year. I want y'all to catch this. This is the promise God gave to Abraham in chapter 17. And since God fulfilled the promise and Isaac is born in chapter 22, he realizes that God who promises always provides. God who tells me one thing always is going to do it. I can trust God because I can trust God's promises. Now, this is, the, this is the kicker for us. You can obey God without asking any questions when you know God is not only provider, but you know whatever God promised, God's going to provide. That he is not simply just provider, but I have something tangible that he's promised me. And because he's promised me things in the past, I know God has fulfilled them in the past and I know he'll do it again. That's why I believe Abraham had this kind of idea and kind of affirmation to his son Isaac. God's going to provide the sacrifice. God's going to provide a, a, a lamb for himself. God's going to do it. Now, I love what God does. 
Because when they get up to the mountain, I shared this on Sunday, that, that, that when he starts to try to slay his son, guess what happens? The angel says, stop. But there's a ram calling the thickets. Now, I'm glad it wasn't a lamb because the rams, the Bible said the ram horns were caught in the thicket. That has, that's something special here. That there are things we're looking for from God. But God knows exactly what we need. God knew that Abraham didn't need a lamb. He needed a ram. The, the lamb would come later on. You, you know who, who that lamb was, that lamb, Jesus Christ. That, that lamb was going to come later on. God, Abraham didn't need a lamb. He needed a ram. And I don't know about you this, this evening or this, this afternoon that you're looking for a lamb. You're looking for something that you think you need. But God said as provider, I got you. Don't worry about the how. Because I've got it, got it already fixed out, fixed, fixed out and fixed up. And however you want to look at it, God says, I've got a ram. It was that ram in the bush. That there is an idea that I, I was in the tight space and I, and I needed some. God provided him a ram in the bush, meaning the ram was what you needed at the present time because the ram was going to get caught up in, in the thicket. Now, we always say, that uh, Abraham and Isaac was climbing up one side of the mountain and uh, God and the ram was climbing up on the other side. But I, I, I don't believe that. I actually believe that God had that ram waiting on Abraham that entire time in that thicket. I believe that God knew the ram needed to be just right there at the present time. And that's what I believe God does in our lives. That's why you need to be free from that worry of how. You, you don't need to worry about how, why? All you gotta do is trust the promises of God. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, if you, if, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, ask whatever you wanna ask in my name and he'll give it to you. He said that cast your cares upon me for I care for you. He said, come unto me all ye that are heavy laden and heavy burdened and I'll give you rest. He said, are you not better than the birds that I take care of that fly in the air and the lilies of the field? He said it, all you gotta do is trust his promises. And if I trust his promises, I know God will provide. And so free yourself from the worry of how. Then I'm, I love this last part, position God in God's rightful place. Abraham, hold your, steal your hand. Steal your hand, Abraham. Because I know you fear God because you withheld your son, your only son. Now, I concentrated on Sunday, this idea of fear. And then and I want to concentrate on that, but I also want to look at this, you withheld your son, your only son as well. Then we'll be finished. I said that you have to position God in God's rightful place. The problem with Abraham was is that he had positioned certain things above God. That literally certain things were larger than his thoughts uh, on God's ability to do whatever God he needed God to do in his life. Meaning, it, I believe God is provider, but these bills are larger than what I imagined. I believe God is healer, but I have cancer and there is no way I can be healed. Right. I, I, there, there are things that we place over God that, yes, I believe God is omnipotent and God is all powerful. But um, the stuff that's happening in the world seems more powerful than God. And, and I don't know if we should pray about this now. You know, uh, li literally, that's what's happening in Abraham's life, that there were things that he was afraid of. You remember in Genesis chapter 12, in Genesis chapter 12, literally, uh, the Bible says that uh uh, Abraham goes down to Egypt. Y'all remember that story? Goes down to Egypt, and he's afraid. He's afraid. He's afraid of Pharaoh. So he says, "This is my, this is my sister, not my wife." Now, now the catch, catcher part is, is God says to him, "Let's go to Genesis chapter twelve, uh, really quick, so that you can see this." At that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abraham to go down to Egypt where he lived as a foreigner. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abraham said to his wife, Sarah, look, you are, very, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them you are my sister. 
Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of the interest in you. L literally, I, I want you to see, God sends him this way. God sends him to Egypt. And as soon as he gets to Egypt, he's afraid and he starts to create a kind of antidote to fix this situation. He has literally put the Egyptian narrative or this, this kind of fear of the Pharaoh above the God who sends him there. How many of us know God placed us where we are, but we allow our fear of the place to cause us not to have faith in God? Genesis chapter 20, verse 11 is the same story. It's, a, it's the same narrative, of, but different characters. This time it's King Abimelech. And the Bible says that he is afraid again. Verse number 11, after he hears, uh, he goes into the city and he sees the, the people, uh, King Abimelech asked him, why did you lie and say this was your sister? When you get a chance, read verse chapter 20 and you'll, you'll see this narrative. Listen to what Abraham says. I thought this is a godless place. They will want my wife and will kill me to get her. She really is my sister. For we both have the same father, but different mothers. Now, Abraham, and that's a whole nother narrative, Abraham and Sarah will actually have sisters and brothers. But Abraham uses this story to say and show how much he was afraid of what King Abimelech was going to do. God is leading you, and you choose to put what you are afraid of over God. That's why I want y'all to see it but that many of us do that in our lives, that we put what is of what is causing us fear or what we are uh, apprehensive about. Many of us haven't stepped out on faith because we are afraid of what's gonna happen. Many of us haven't done what the Lord called us to do because we are afraid of what's gonna happen. But God says, if you put me in my rightful place, you don't have a reason to fear Pharaoh. If you put me in my rightful place as sovereign Lord, you have no reason to fear King Abimelech. Why? Because I'm the one taking care of you. But then I love what the angel says. The angel says, because you have withheld your son, your only son, meaning that which you love, that which you care for, you don't put over God. God has to be in God's rightful place. Can I ask you a question as we conclude? What are you putting over God? Is it a fear? Is it a loved one? Is it a car? What, what is it that you have here and have God here? What is it that's in competition with God? God says that you should have no other gods before me. That means nothing before me. Well, what do you have over God? The, God says, the angel says to Abraham, God knows now that you revere me. You honor me. You have placed me above your fears. You have placed, placed me above your family. You have placed me above yourself. And all you're saying to me is here I am. Now, that's the question that we need to have. We need to have the here I am faith of Abraham. They say, God, I trust you no matter what. I'm following you, no questions asked. Whatever you say, yes, Lord, I'll obey. No questions asked. Amen. I hope that you were blessed by this experience and this Bible study. Please, please, please share this uh, Bible study with others so others can be blessed um, by this series of Roadblocks to Imagination. This is available on our website and you can also um, a request a CD and, and purchase a DVD as well. And we will make sure we get that to you if you want it for your home archives. The whole series um, for from uh, Take the Risk, uh, to Embrace the Opposition, um, to Change Your Attitude from That Don't Make Sense to Yes, Lord, Whatever You Say, to the decision to obey God. No questions asked. If you have been blessed, uh, purchase that and send it to someone and let someone know how uh, this has blessed you and you want to be a blessing to them. You can be a blessing to East Mount Zion Baptist Church at this moment um, by sharing a gift to our church. If you've been blessed by anything that you've seen, why don't you share a gift to our church 
uh, in, in a seed offering, uh, you can text EMZBC to the number 77977 and you can also mail in your gift and the information is on the screen uh, as well as dropping by the church. We are so grateful for uh, you continuing to support us. Please, please, please share this with someone else. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're not subscribed. Also follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well. Again, thank you all so much. I'm so excited about what God is doing in the life of our church. We will begin starting in the month of this February, in February, with uh, a new series called Return to Imagination. And we're only talking about going back to our history because there's something in our history that teaches us about um, our present and helps us even with our future. And so we're going to be listening to some narratives from those individuals who um, were here uh, in the 60s and 70s. And they'll be talking about the significance of our church um, because I believe there's a message in where we came from that teaches us about our future. So you stay tuned, stay connected to our church. Uh, join us on our morning prayer call every morning at 6 a.m. as well as our Sunday school classes and everything else. You can look on our website and get that information. Again, thank you so much for sharing with us and I pray you are blessed by the word. I always never uh, take it for granted that you do not know Christ. And if you do not know Christ and don't have a relationship with Christ, I want to offer Christ to you. Um, there are so many ways that you can um, come. You can come by letter, uh, meaning that you are leaving a church and coming to our church. And that's that's something that people don't do as much anymore. Or you can come by candidate for baptism. Uh, candidate for baptism is I want the Lord uh, in my life and I've never been baptized and you want to do so, you can most certainly do that and we will make that happen. Uh, or you can come on your Christian experience um, and we identify that as a new commitment, you committing to our church or recommitting to our church or you want to be a new disciple. New disciple is, is that I want to be baptized and I've been baptized and I want to be connected to God. Uh, all of those pieces and I'm praying for you that the Lord would touch your heart and connect with with you and connect you to him and him to you. Amen. Let us pray right now and give the Lord's benediction. May the Lord you bless us. May you keep us. May your face ever shine upon us. May you lift up your countenance and give us peace. May you bless us in going in and going out, in rising and even in falling. May you be a blessing to all of us. It is in your name we pray. Amen.